I ask that you turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, in just a few moments, we'll find our beginning place this evening for our lesson, our study together from the Word of God. I continue to be quite encouraged by the pleasant associations of this gospel meeting, your kind expressions of goodwill to me, and the work that I'm trying to do in the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, certainly, I appreciate the interest of so many who have come as we continue for these few days of doing what the Bible says, and that is, of course, we're here to worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and in truth. We have folks from other places visiting, longtime friends, Gene Powers, Doug Barnes. Uh, we were all together years ago in Puerto Rico serving our country, and they've remained dear friends for a long, long time. We love and appreciate them and their families. Glad for them to be here and others as well. Do appreciate your hospitality, all that you're doing to contribute to this gospel meeting. We're talking about being faithful. You know, the Apostle Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 to make our calling and election sure. I want to do that. Don't you want to do that? Don't you want to make your calling and election sure? Don't you want to be faithful to the Lord? The Lord has begun a good work in us. That's what Philippians 1 says. And verse 6 says, and so it is incumbent upon us then, as Philippians 2 and verse 12 says, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So the Lord wants us to be with Him in heaven when this life is over. You think about a local congregation. One of the blessings, one of the functions, I believe, of a local congregation is to help each other make it to heaven. We are the family of God. We are joined together to encourage one another to be God's people, to function together in a particular location as you're doing here at Seminole Point. And as you rely upon God, you rely upon each other as well. That's why the Bible tells us that all the members of the body are absolutely important. We all function together to do what God says because we want to serve God. We want to be faithful there are people in the book of Revelation that were challenged to be faithful in spite of great persecution, great obstacles that came to them. I want you to look as we begin in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation in verse 11. The apostle John, as verse 10 says, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he is hearing something. He hears the voice as of a trumpet, verse 11, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last, what you see write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. I want you to think about these Christians that we are reading about. I want us to think about... Here we go. These seven churches of Asia... These Christians who were scattered throughout Asia <coughs> Minor in the seven churches of Asia that we're reading about here in chapter 1 and verse 11, these Christians who lived in these cities, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, these Christians scattered among these churches, they knew something about emperor worship. I want you to think about the fact that they were well aware of the emperor and they were well aware of what emperor worship was all about. They knew something about that. For example, look in chapter 2 and verse 13. Look in Revelation 2 and verse 13, talking to the church at Pergamos, the Lord is saying this, I know your works where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. In the city of Pergamos, there was a temple dedicated to Augustus Caesar, the August one. And why not? The emperor is honored in worship by the inhabitants of the Roman Empire. The emperor, Augustus Caesar, is worshipped as Lord and God. And these Christians knew about that. That is, they were confronted with emperor worship day after day after day. And why not? Why not worship Caesar? Because after all, Caesar is sovereign of the universe. He is indeed the one who is uh, in control of all. And so these temples were built to honor the gods and to honor the Caesars as well. I want you to look in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. <coughs> Pardon me. Chapter 13 and verse 1. 
Pardon me, please. Look in chapter 13 and verse 5. You and I, because we have read Acts chapter 19, great is Diana of the Ephesians. But that wasn't the only temple in the city of Ephesus. In Revelation 13 and verse 5, it says this. He was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. When you read the book of Revelation, you are confronted with the fact that you have the emperor, you have emperor worship, and in connection with that, obviously so, you have false worship as well. And so in the city of Ephesus, uh, one of the seven churches of Asia, there was there a temple that honored Caesar Domitian. And Caesar Domitian said, call me Lord and God. You bow down, you recognize me as Lord and God. And if you don't do that, things are going to not go well for you. So again, why wouldn't the people who lived in the Roman Empire do this? Why wouldn't all of the people bow down to worship Caesar Augustus or Domitian or whomever the Caesar might be at the time? Why wouldn't they go to the temple and make sacrifices in honor and worship unto these, unto these men? What are these Christians going to do? These Christians are trying to be faithful, aren't they? These Christians are just like you and I are. Uh, you and I are trying to be faithful, and they're trying to be faithful as well. And they have their challenges, and we'll talk about that a little bit in our lesson this evening. What are they going to do? If they were here tonight, we would say, don't you want to be faithful? They would say, yes, we want to be faithful as well. You and I want to be faithful. What are they going to do, and what are we going to do when we are confronted with these kinds of challenges? These people that lived in the seven churches, these Christians who were scattered among the seven churches of Asia, uh, they knew what temples were all about. When you look at a temple, for example, in the city of Ephesus, or you look in any city that we have read about in chapter 1 and verse 11, when you go to the temple, you are well aware, first of all, of an altar. And on that altar, sacrifices are made and there is a priest who is officiating at the altar. And so every temple would have its own priest. It was sometimes the case, if you had the means, if you had the wherewithal, if you had the money, that you could perhaps buy your way into the temple, and you become the priest of that temple, and then you officiate in the sacrifices that are being made to the Caesar. And if you were able to do that, if you were able to work your way into that position, it could be quite lucrative for you. I think we can see pragmatically uh, how that would benefit someone. And what the priest would do, the priest would, the priest would lead people in worship unto the Caesar, Caesar Augustus or Domitian or Nero, wh whoever the person might be. And so you think about this. You have these Christians scattered among these churches throughout the Roman Empire. Think about it now. And so the, the empire joins together to pay homage to their God. And so you go to the temple and you give a sacrifice, you pay a sum of money, you make a sacrifice to thank your particular God, the God of rain, or the God of the crops, or the God of prosperity, or the God of sex, the God of wine, or whatever it may be. Uh, a multiplicity of gods, you see, that you might bow down and pay homage to. But ultimately, overriding all of that would be the Caesars. Domitian, for example, I believe the book of Revelation fits the context of Caesar Domitian. That is a subject of discussion, not tonight. But nevertheless, Caesar is saying, bow down and worship me. I am Lord, I am God. And if you do that, everything's going to be okay. So let's get back to these Christians in these seven churches. What are they going to do? How are they going to respond to the altar and to the priest, to this call for worship, come and, and bow down and recognize Caesar as Lord, as God. Let me just say this quickly. When we study the book of Revelation, we are confronted with the number seven. And I'm sure you have heard preachers and Bible class teachers say, I believe appropriately so, that seven is the perfect number a combination of Father, Son, and Spirit, three, and then perhaps the four corners of the earth. Completeness is the idea. And I believe there were literally seven churches of Asia, but I still say they could be and were representative of all of God's people, not just the seven, but many more like them.
Now, what is happening to these people? What is happening to these people now in the book of Revelation? It's time to look in chapter 2 and verse 10. Do that with me, please. Look in chapter 2 and verse 10. This has to do with the church at Smyrna. It says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Ten, of course, an apocalyptic number signifying completeness. Ten fingers, ten toes, those kinds of things. So for a definite, complete period of time, persecution is coming upon God's people. Then it says this, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, sometimes we say something like this, We all need to be faithful until we die, and that's absolutely true. But really, I believe this is saying even to the point of death. Even if it means your death, you be faithful unto the Lord. That's what's happening to these people, you see. They are under the threat of persecution from the Roman Empire. The combination of Caesar and his ego, the combination of Caesar and then false religion working hand in hand, controlling the Roman Empire at this time. Chapter 2 and verse 13, we've already read it, but just look at the passage. Chapter 2 and verse 13 talks about Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. The reality then, the reality now, the whole world lies in the evil one. The, the devil didn't want these people to be faithful in their own generation. The devil doesn't want any of us to be faithful in our own generation. And of course, he is doing whatever is within his power to do to try to circumvent, to undermine faith and allegiance in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're reading about. Now, again, what are these people going to do? I believe you will agree with me if I were to just go one by one and say, well, were these people under great pressure? Were they under great pressure to capitulate, to give in? The going is getting rough for them. What are they going to do? You know because you've read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You have the seven churches of Asia, and how does each paragraph, if you will, end? Each paragraph ends... He that hath a what? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Seven times, every time, every letter, seven times, seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear. God is saying, listen to what I am saying. And I'll tell you, if you're being persecuted, if you're under the threat of persecution in whatever form that persecution may come to you, whether it is then or now, we need to do what? We need to hear what the Lord is saying to us. And so this idea of being persecuted, we recognize, of course, that persecution came to them, persecution can come to us, and what will fortify us, what will help you and me be faithful in our own generation. What I'm saying is we need to listen to what God says. Now the question is this. When we say, okay, we're going to listen to what God says, what does God say? That is, what is the book of Revelation talking to you and me about? And this is the lesson. As a way to encourage these Christians, the Lord is telling them, God is alive and well. That's the song we sing at home. I'm sure you do here as well. Our God, He is what? Our God, He is alive. And that's what the message of Revelation is all about, that God reigns and the Lamb lives. And it was a message that they were to hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. God is alive. God is reigning. The Lamb is alive and well. And so it is that would fortify these people, that would help these people understand that indeed we are invited to participate in the reign of God. We are invited to participate with the crucified Savior. And what chapters 4 and 5, I believe chapters 4 and 5, first of all, are inseparable, but really they are the key, I think, to what the book of Revelation is talking to us about. I would say, why would that not be the case? In the order of Revelation, this is what we have. We have chapter 4, then we have chapter 5, and it sets the tone, you see, for the rest of the book of Revelation. So spend the rest of our time with me this evening considering just a few things from these two chapters. 
as we think about uh, this vision, this, this vision from the Lord that John, the apostle, the apostle of love, is introduced to. You have, first of all, in chapter 4 and verse 1, you can look at your Bibles and go along with me verse by verse. It says this, chapter 4 and verse 1, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. The first thing we have is an invitation. An invitation is issued to John the Apostle. An invitation is issued to him. The Lord says, I want you to look. I want you to see what is going on before the throne of God. I would tell you this, the word throne is used 43 times in the book of Revelation. The word lamb is used 28 times in the book of Revelation. And I would extrapolate from that at least this much. The Lord is trying to get us to focus on what? On the throne and on the Lamb. That's what the revelation is talking to us about. That's what John is being introduced to. And so you have this invitation. I want you to look in verse 1. It says, I hear this voice. But back up and look in chapter 1 and verse 10 once again. Be reminded we've already heard the voice of God. That is, throughout the book of Revelation, you hear the voice of God. Verse 10, chapter 1. <clears throat> I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. And let us say this, again, he that hath an ear, let him hear. When you hear the voice of God, you need to do what? You need to listen. You need to pay attention to the voice of God. When God is speaking to you and me, we need to pay attention to it. We cannot afford not to listen to God as it was true of these Christians as well. They're being persecuted. They needed to pay attention to the voice of God. And so you have this voice, this invitation, and John now is looking and he sees the throne. And the question is, what does he see? And he sees, shall we say, a beehive of activity. That is, you have all kinds of things going on. You have all kinds of things taking place before the throne of God. And the vision is a vision of worship. Now think about that. You and I are here tonight to do as the Bible says, to worship our Heavenly Father. That's what we are doing. That's what we are endeavoring to do. And that's what these folks were doing here, if you will. Uh, that's what the inhabitants of heaven, shall I say, in a better way, before the throne of God. So when God invites John... In a very real sense, he is inviting you and me as well. He is inviting all of us. I want you to look. I want you to see. I want you to understand indeed what is going on. You have this throne scene. Look down in chapter 4 and verse 2. Immediately, John says this, Immediately I was in the Spirit, that is led by the Holy Spirit of God, inspiration, I believe, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Again, the throne, 43 times. Uh, somebody I was reading after suggested that this idea of the throne is the hermeneutical key to the book of Revelation. Hermeneutics is just a fancy word for the uh, process of Bible study. But the point is, when you have something mentioned over and over and over again, do what? He that hath an ear, let him hear. Pay attention to what the Lord is saying. And so when you think about the throne, you, you get that fixed in your mind, you're going to have a better understanding of, of the book of Revelation. Now you see one who is set on the throne, verse 2 of chapter 4. We're talking about God sitting on His throne. He is the Creator. He is the one who is reigning. He is the one who is worthy of our complete devotion. Not Caesar, not Domitian, not Nero, not Caesar Augustus, but Almighty God, Jehovah God. He alone is worthy of our complete devotion, of all that we can possibly give to Him, the very best that we can give of who we are, of our time, of our energy, of our, of our efforts to understand what the Word of God is all about. Now, Jesus, of course, is a part of this as well. 
You see this in chapter 5 and verse 6. Jump ahead and look at that with me. Look in Revelation 5 and verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a what? Stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Not only do you have God, the Creator, you have God the Father, but you have the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who does what? Who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John 1.29 says. John, you see, talks about this a great deal in his writings. But what you see in the book of Revelation is you see God on the throne and you see the Lamb there as well. But you see the Lamb who has been slaughtered. You see the Lamb who has been slaughtered. The one who was slaughtered, who was crucified, who was, who was hung on that cross. It is the power of Christ. I'm thinking of this, if I'm getting it correct, in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, when Paul is praying about the thorn in the flesh. He says, take it away. He prays three times and the Lord says, no, I'm not going to take it away. But the power of Christ will help you deal with this. That's what the power of Christ is doing, you see, in the book of Revelation. So again, you have God who is sovereign. God who is ruling and reigning. Caesar's not in charge. He just thinks he's in charge. He thinks he's on the, the real throne. And everybody else who bows down to him, they think the same thing. But guess what? He's not. And persecuted people need to understand that. If you're having your head put on the chopping block or your family's being taken away, forced into slavery or worse, whatever it may be, you would be discouraged. Perhaps you would need that kind of encouragement. And what these chapters tell you and me, these chapters tell us that above all, God is what? God is worthy. He alone is worthy. And that, that's what you see when you approach the throne of God. This is not child's play. This is not just an esoteric exercise to talk about what the Word of God says for a little bit on Saturday night. This is serious business. As it was then, so it is now. To think about the responsibility, the privilege, yes, but the responsibility to come into the presence of God. You can think about it like this. John is pulling back the curtain. He's pulling back the curtain on the throne scene. In heaven, And as he pulls back the curtain, what, what do we see? I'll tell you what we see. We see where the real power is. Not in the Roman government, not in the Roman army, not in Caesar. We see the real power in God. Look in chapter 4 and verse 11, just to jump ahead. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. That's what we've been singing about in such a beautiful way. And thank you for that. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. You are worthy, O Lord. That's where the real power is. Now, as we continue looking in chapter 4, we see the one who was sitting upon the throne, and how was he described? Now, I want you to look at your Bibles, verses 3 and 4. In verse 3 it says, And he who sat there was like a jasper, and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. If you lived in the first century, as I've said, you know what a temple is all about. You know what an altar is all about. You know what priests are all about and what they're doing. You also know that there are throngs and throngs of people who are rushing to the temple to worship, to pay homage to their God or to Caesar. And so you have the attendants around these temples. And so it is in this heavenly throne scene, there are attendants as well. And you have these verses that tell us here is God and here are these people who are around the throne of God and the, the visions of these uh, various beasts and those kinds of things. 
and they are there to do, to do homage unto God, to worship God. You see in verse 20, uh, in verse 3, I should have said, you have uh, these stones, of course. You have John describing what he sees with these precious stones. Uh, the rainbow, you think of the beauty of a rainbow. You have these heavenly beings, all of creation. We talk about the 24 elders. Who are the 24 elders? A common explanation is you have 12 and 12. And really 12 and 12, 12, 12 times 12 is 144, 144,000 of the redeemed in the book of Revelation. And so you have that combination of numbers. Perhaps the Old Testament, the 12 apostles. Uh, in the New Testament, I got that mixed up, didn't I? The 12 tribes of Israel, then the 12 apostles in the New Testament. Uh, let it signify perhaps all of God's people. All of God's people. What are they wearing? They're wearing white robes. What does that signify? Doesn't that signify purity? Would we expect anything less to be around the throne of God? But how are their robes able to be, to be white? Uh, I want you to look in chapter 7. Look in chapter 7 of Revelation in verse 14. They have white robes. They have crowns. What are they doing? Well, they are ruling and reigning with God. They are there before the throne of God. How is that possible? I thought they were losing their lives. Their, their blood was being shed in persecution. Yes, it was. Look in chapter 7 and verse 14. And I said to him, Sir, you know, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's how they can have white robes. They can have white robes because their robes were washed in the blood of the Lamb. That is, Jesus died. He gave up his life. He shed his blood to make salvation from sin possible, to be in a relationship with God, to ultimately be before the throne of God. And now here they are depicted before the throne of God in chapter 4. And you see the, the, the white robes. You see the beauty. You see the sea, if you will. Look in verse 5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices, seven lamps of fire which were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man. The fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now what are we talking about? Who are these? Whom is, is John describing? Let me just say this quickly. We don't have time to do this or have chosen not to do this in our lesson this evening. We're not going to go back to the Old Testament. But when we go back to the Old Testament, for example, Daniel chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel chapter 1. I would say quickly and parenthetically, you cannot understand the book of Revelation as it is meant to be understood without also studying the Old Testament. And when you go back to the Old Testament and you see the vision of, of Isaiah, you see the Ancient of Days descending from heaven to his throne in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. You remember what Isaiah says in Isaiah 6 when he falls in, in, in the presence of God? He says what? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Uh, some of you know that Marilyn and I go to Ethiopia quite often, and the word in the Amharic language for holy is kadus. And when I hear the Ethiopian preachers and brethren reading the Bible and singing, and when I hear them say kadus, 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 I know they're saying holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. And it lifts them up. And it lifts you and me up, doesn't it? You and I are lifted up, as it were, in this heavenly vision before the throne of God. And we see God in all His beauty with the precious stones. The four and twenty elders, the four living creatures, 
that clearly comes from Daniel, and it comes from Isaiah representing the power of God, the line and the bear, uh, the, the intelligence of a man. You have symbolic language. The book of Revelation has a historical context. It obviously have a, has a symbolic context as well. And what all of this says is here you have the inhabitants of heaven. Before the throne of God, what are they doing? They are worshiping God. They are worshiping God. They are paying honor to God. Why? Because verse 11 says, He is worthy. He alone is worthy. Not Caesar. Not Domitian. Not Caesar Augustus. Not Nero. But God alone. They're being persecuted. They needed to be reminded of that. And so do you and I. Look in verse 8 of chapter 4. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Caduce, caduce, caduce. Holy, holy, holy. You see the ceaseless praise, the ceaseless worship, of these people who have come into the presence of God. And in their worship, what are they saying? God is worthy. That's what worship is. You and I are here to worship God, and when we worship God, we are ascribing worth to God. Now, how much is God worth to you? How much is God worth to me? Is He worth every fiber of our being, all of our time and energy, all that we are, the very essence of our being, that we would honor God and worship God and praise God. He alone is worthy. You talk about the four and twenty elders. I've concluded it's not so much who is doing this, but what are they doing? What are they doing? They are praising God. They are giving, they are giving honor to God, the four and twenty elders, and the four living creatures. And so it is, they are standing in the, kneeling in the presence of God, I should have said, bowing down before Him. And that's what we do when we come to worship, to remember that indeed God is holy, holy, holy. Caduce, caduce, caduce. Now what does all of this mean? Let's make an application what about you and me? That is, how can you and I apply what these chapters are talking to us about? The first thing I would say is this, that we can meet God before His throne. He is inviting you and me to come into His presence. God invites, he invites us to come into His presence, to come before His throne. But He says when we come before His throne we need to recognize, we need to remember that our worship is centered on Him. Our worship must always be centered on God. Now what about the failure to worship? I know we preachers and elders, for example, sometimes we talk about church attendance. We talk about the need to attend and to be faithful in our attendance and not miss a gospel meeting and those kinds of things. And I, I understand all of that. I believe it has, uh, uh, all of those things are proper. They have their place. But I'll tell you, my friends, it goes, it goes far beyond that. When we recognize that God is worthy, we'll stop asking, do I have to go to a gospel meeting? When we recognize that God is worthy, we'll stop bellyaching about what we have to do in Bible class. It's taking up too much time taking up too much of my money, whatever it may be. A failure to worship. It, it, when we fail to worship, in reality, we, we have no place to go. That is, we can't come into the presence of God. We're not before the throne of God. When we refuse to worship, we are consigned to a life that has no center. We're going to be wandering aimlessly with no purpose, no direction in life. Because that's what it ultimately is all about. Who is God? He is the one who alone is worthy, and that we worship Him. 
And without God, we are swept into restlessness. We have no direction. We have no purpose of life. Worship really is the heartbeat. The worship of God is the heartbeat of the universe. Now think about it. We, we can be a part of that. We can be a part of that. He invites us to be a part of that. Or we can bow to Caesar. You have that choice. I have that choice. We can receive the mark of the beast. Look in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. We can receive the mark of the beast. Look in verse 15, chapter 13. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That is, if you refuse to bow down before Caesar, you may end up losing your life. Verse 16, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. If seven is perfection, one less than seven is imperfection. The mark of the beast. Now, if you don't want to serve God, if I don't want to serve God, we can make that choice. We can keep our jobs. We can keep our money. We can keep our popularity. We can keep our standing, whatever it is, in the circles in which we operate. But I'll tell you, when you give your heart to Caesar, when you give your heart to Caesar, what are you going to do when that Caesar's gone? Because one seizure comes and another, he lives and he dies, and then another seizure comes along and he's gone. You remember what Daniel says, Daniel chapter 4, that the Most High rules where? In the kingdoms of men. Guess who's in charge? Not Caesar, not some political leader in this world in which you and I live, not the President of the United States. Not the Supreme Court. Not our elected officials. Ultimately, who is in charge? God is. Now, we can bow to Caesar. But when that Caesar is gone, then what are we left with? What are we left with? Then I would have you think with me about this. Only God is worthy. Only God is worthy to receive what we should give Him. Let me put it another way. Only God is worthy to receive what we should want to give Him. And what we should want to give to God is what He deserves, what He is worthy of, the total devotion of our lives, of our hearts, the praise, the honor, the adoration that we can give to God because He is worthy and to share in that rule, that heavenly reign, in that rule, to wear that crown of gold when this life comes to an end. And what John says is, the Lord has invited me to look, and He's telling you and me, I, I, am, I am telling you, here is God on His throne. He's telling these persecuted Christians that indeed, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of persecution, everything's going to be okay. You may lose your life, be thou faithful unto death, I will give thee the crown of life. You may lose your job. You may not be popular with your neighbors. Even your loved ones may turn against you but you remember that indeed God is worthy. Revelation chapter 5, let's read it, and then the lesson will be yours. 
Revelation chapter 5, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth, under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. May God give us all the strength to say as they did, Amen. All to the glory of God. Can we help you obey the Lord while we stand, while we sing? We pray you'll come. What can